thank you all for coming and thank you for being in this beautiful room which I'll speak about later on and uh, thank you also for Wendy Zinn if she's here for making those gorgeous posters that suddenly erupted all over campus um, and uh, probably drew some of you people in here. Um, I have to talk fairly fast because I'm actually going to tell you two or three different stories because this talk actually began um, as this story which I gave last year at the Women's Faculty Club and then the Institute for Classical Arts and Architecture um, but I could only hint at um, a broader problem that I was beginning to see um, on campus. So it starts as this uh, about the two Hearst plans and then uh, becomes this. Um, <laughs> Um, as Nathan said, I've had the advantage of being at Cal, actually now it's hard to believe this, for nearly half a century. I came as an undergraduate, and so I have the advantage of being the institution's memory, and I've got a pretty good one, and so um, the students, of course, don't have that uh, same luxury because they're here for such a short period of time, so they're not aware of the radical changes that have been taking place at the university and how they are reflected in the physical makeup of the, uh, the environment which we all use all the time and which so many just take for granted and they have no idea where it came from let alone where it's going and that's what largely concerns me both the future but very much the past as well too you can't have one without the other now about 35 years ago I started writing about the campus I started doing um, feature articles in the alumni magazine like this one um, and um, here's that uh, spread and what I wanted to ask, answer at that time was how was such a great beginning, which you're going to see, um, for the planning and the buildings of the university, could we have built such shit after the Second World War? Um, I mean, you know, it was uh, just appalling, but uh, we just sort of forgot about it all, and it seems then we sort of remembered again, and now we're forgetting all over again, so I guess it's just sort of cyclical. Um, and then I wrote for the Daily Cal, et cetera, et cetera, the rest is history. Um, but um, let's go back to the founding of the university as the College of California uh, in downtown Oakland. Yes, this is downtown Oakland. It's now a parking lot right in the center of Oakland. Um, but it was founded by um, good congregational ministers, uh, products of the New England um, Enlightenment, who came out to California uh, in the post-Gold Rush period with the idea of bringing New England Enlightenment here, um, like Henry Durant right there, uh, the namesake of Durant Hall and the Durant um, Bar uh, over in the hotel over there, uh, which I much enjoy. But um, Henry and his colleagues at that time um, had the idea of bringing a true liberal arts education to California. They had a hell of a time uh, financing the college and so in 1868 they agreed to give the land that they had here um, and their library to the new University of California they blended together. And this is why the University of California starts out somewhat differently than most other land-grant colleges around universities around the country. They wanted this to be a true university, one offering the full spectrum of studies, including the liberal arts, and they were very insistent on that. Now, um, there's a new biography of Peter Sather by uh, Karen Sven, um, and uh, she has an interesting anecdote in here. Um, on one particular day, a local notable who had been publicly singing the praises of the new college um, had been invited to give the students a lecture on the importance of education. To everyone's horror, this gentleman proceeded to hold forth on future careers and possible sources of income and warned the students about wasting precious years of their youth on subjects that were of no use to society and would not put money in their pockets either. <laughs> when he was done, he happily surveyed the auditorium, um, waiting for the applause to erupt, but no one clapped. And the professor, who had imagined the event, um, who, who um, had organized the event, was left bewailing the fact that he had been so wrong about this man. Well, how quaint that sounds today, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> 
no job recruiters on the campus at that time. So it was a, to be a full service university. Now, let's introduce a fortune. Um, Missouri miner George Hurst comes out to California during the gold rush. He makes his first big strike in Virginia City and of course goes on uh, to build one of the great mining fortunes of the world. Um, so much so that he's able to be to buy himself a senatorship um, and uh, he's a senator for about four years and then dies in office in 1891. Um, leaving this vast fortune largely to his wife, his widow, um, and there's her home down in uh, Pleasanton, the little cottage down there, and right over there there's a portrait which you'll see later on of their only child, William Randolph Hearst. Um, so Phoebe basically inherits this gigantic fortune. What's she going to do with it? Well, there's a certain rivalry with another strong-willed woman down the peninsula, Jane. Um, she and her husband, um, also Senator, Senator Stanford, uh, build this college in memory of their son down on their farm down there. And uh, so Phoebe, I think there's a certain amount of rivalry going on between these two women. Phoebe also in 1893 goes to Chicago and sees, no this isn't the loop, um, this is the, this is the uh, World's Columbian Exposition uh, in 1893 and this really torqued American taste because it imbued people with the idea of classicism. Um, and this is going to have a big influence on this university which to some extent is a permanent World's Fair. Now this is Berkeley in the 1890s, uh, just about that time, uh, you can see that there's a lot of open space, there's not much on campus, and this is when Phoebe comes to town um, and decides to uh, take the university under her capacious wing. Um, here's a story of two odd couples. Um, Phoebe and William Randolph Hearst uh, down at their place in Pleasanton and then in Berkeley, um, slightly different, uh, Bernard Maybeck and his wife Annie on their house on Northside. Uh, he was teaching in the engineering department, sort of a fledgling architecture class and um, they get together and then also there is uh, Maybeck's prize student uh, Julia Morgan from Oakland and these five become lifetime friends and uh, the Maybeck and Morgan become clients of the Hearsts for the rest of their lives. It's a very interesting story. Um, in 1896, Phoebe uh, announces that she wants to give to the university a memorial to her husband and Maybeck says, well, what good is there to give a beautiful building to the campus because it doesn't have a plan. She agrees and, and offers to the regents to sponsor an international competition to make the university the most beautiful campus in the world. The, now, this is what Harper's Weekly had to say about it in 1899. The first a uh, phase of it is judged in Antwerp, the second in San Francisco. This really puts Berkeley on the map because most people think that, you know, Phoebe's just going to fund the whole thing. And here's the prize winning uh, design. This is by B Emile Benard of Paris and it was going to basically build Paris on the uh, slopes of Berkeley. Um, well, uh, Mr. Benard was a bit uh, irascible and insults Mrs. Hurst and wants more money and so he's invited to leave and the, um, oh yes, here's his gym. You can see why he won. He was just a superb draftsman. Uh, but this could have been our gym. Um, <laughs> Years later, uh, Bob and I were in Vienna and we saw the Kunsthistorisches Museum and I realized where he got the idea from. Uh, this could have been Harman. Um, and so they asked the, one of the runner-ups, John Galen Howard, to come out from New York and supervise the plan. For the next almost quarter of a century, he is the campus czar because the terms of the contract are that he will have total control over the design of the campus, no other architect unless a donor specifies another architect. And that's not going to go into effect for about 23 years. Okay, here's the Phoebe Hearst plan, which is actually the John Galen Howard plan of 1914, modified. Um, and I'm just going to show you a few of the buildings of the Phoebe Hearst plan. The first one, of course, is the Memorial Gymnasium, which is one of the finest of John Galen Howard's buildings, probably because Julia Morgan was working in his office and had a hand in designing it. It has magnificent interiors. A mining, did I say, what did I say? Yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, there's George uh, in the Memorial Hall and then uh, the Hearst um, Greek Theater. 
never finished as it was supposed to be finished. It was all going to be paneled in marble. Um, and then Durant Hall and California Hall, one of two of my favorites. And I just want to remind you that they did beautiful, uh, Howard did beautiful interiors. This was the uh, law school library, now a reception area, but it's all done in Siena marble, mahogany, bronze light fixtures. And then this is in Stevens Hall, the uh, senior commons room, the graduate commons room. Uh, this hall is actually named after a historian, if you can imagine such a thing. Not a billionaire, but a historian who was responsible for buying the Bancroft Library. Um, Doe Library, one of my favorites. Um, this is one of John Galen Howard's beautiful design uh, drawings. And it, it was built just as, as he planned it. It has these superb rooms in it. It's hard to believe. I mean, this is not an Ivy League university. This is a public university. And here are some students a few years ago expressing their love for the library and when they were protesting to ask for it to remain open more often uh, so that they could actually use it. I love these kids. Um, another one of John Galen Howard's drawings. And to a large extent, this ideal city of learning came into being. That's the amazing thing, largely because he was campus czar for such a long time, but also because of the generosity of donors and the state. Um, this is the ideal city of learning. It is imbued um, with the love of people who have passed through here, millions of people. The Campanile becomes the beacon of enlightenment, um, not only to Berkeley, but to all Californians. Instantly at recognizable when you see it behind some big brain on uh, the PBS NewsHour. You know immediately where you are. Um, okay. Um, and um, it really, these buildings have tremendous power. Uh, they are why alums um, to a large extent um, have the love that they do and hopefully will cough up money in the future uh, because of the, the, the affection and the allegiance they have to the place. Oops, I'm sorry, that's the wrong slide. Um, <clears throat> now, um, many of you have probably seen um, Frederick Wiseman's four-hour epic at Berkeley, um, and uh, it's a fascinating film uh, because nobody has commented that actually the buildings, the John Galen Howard buildings, play a very strong supporting role in it all through the thing. They give you subliminal messages. They are what represents Berkeley, not just the Campanile, but all the other ones as well, too. Um, and they're also, of course, in uh, Robert Reich's new film, Inequality for All. They have tremendous subliminal power, and they represent, again, what public education once was supposed to be. I want to just show you some of the details, because we walk past them all the time. Think of the materials and the craftsmanship that go, went into these buildings and what they meant. The buildings were meant by Howard and Hearst and others to be enlightening themselves. They are part of your education. They are to uplift you. Um, and they're just as applicable for a student, a poor student from Turlock, as they are from anybody from San Francisco or Los Angeles who might have the money to travel. This is California Hall. I mean, the craftsmanship is extraordinary, as well as the materials. Thank God the, the granite is as hard as it is, because they never expected we'd stop maintaining it. Um, Oops, um, another wrong slide. Um, this is not the kind of building that the Chinese tourists traveling, uh, you know, walking around campus pause to take photographs of. They photograph the John Galen Howard buildings for very good reason. Now, Howard, I've come to realize, was, you know, he was an extremely versatile architect. He could also work in wood. This is the old architecture building where he taught, now Northgate Hall. A beautiful interior, especially when the sun's pouring through the windows there. Um, he could also design with nature. This is Gwinnell Annex, and then one of his most unusual buildings, the old senior men's hall. Hard to believe that a Beaux-Arts graduate could do something like that. This is the uh, monument to him in front of the Campanile. This is a memorial, and I'm going to keep coming back to the, the, the meaning of memorial. Now, second story, the second Hearst plan. All this time, Bernard Maybeck, who had kicked off the Hearst plan, the Phoebe Hearst plan, had been kept off campus because of the contract with campus czar John Galen Howard. There he is at the Bohemian Grove with his tam o um, and um, he was a true Bohemian. Now, this is later on in life, and in 1912, 
1913, he gets the chance to design this and build this for the 1915 World's Fair in San Francisco, the Palace of Fine Arts. This is a fascinating building. I think um, Margaret is going to talk about it a bit more. What you have to understand about the Palace of Fine Arts is it's not just a building. It is total site design. Um, the, the plants, the water, everything are integrated into the building and this is the way that Maybeck always worked. He's fascinated by ruins. He's fascinated by the passage of time. He's fascinated, well, by the memento mori, these, these paintings which, in fact, are about the passage of time and a warning against hubris. Um, against Vanitas. Uh, and I think that is the key to not only the Palace of Fine Arts but the other buildings, monumental buildings that he built. In 19, at the end of 1915 the, the PPIE, the fair, is torn down. Um, all of it was to be torn down but one building wasn't and that is the Palace of Fine Arts. And that's because Phoebe Apperson Hearst and William Randolph Hearst and be, partly because of their friendship with Maybeck, but because they sincerely loved that building and began a campaign to save it. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have it today. Now, look at the similarities. Here's one of the planter boxes at the Palace of Fine Arts, and here's one of the planter boxes at the Phoebe Hearst Gym. And you can see it's, it was just carried over. These are mourning women in classical garb. Um, I'll be coming back to that. 1919, um, Phoebe dies in the flu epidemic and President Wheeler retires. He had been considered during the war a little bit too close to Germany and the Kaiser, who was a friend of his, and so he's out of the scene. And this is bad news for John Galen Howard because he's lost two of his biggest supporters. And apparently he's had a kind of an alienation from Phoebe's son, William Randolph Hearst. Not a good thing to do. 1923 is a pivotal year because in September there's a great fire which burns off the North Berkeley Hills and then shortly thereafter the Memorial Stadium opens up. Now Memorial Stadium was a bait and switch job because initially the alums had been contributing money for a building that was supposed to be on the south side somewhere but at the last minute the regents switch it to where it is now. And John Galen Howard was adamantly opposed to this. He didn't want it there for reasons I'll come back to, but he eventually agrees to design it and so there it is as a John Galen Howard design. But in putting up opposition he actually um, uh, gets on the wrong side of the regents. Again, not a good thing to do. And so an immense um, uh, gouge is cut out of the mouth of Strawberry Canyon to accommodate the uh, stadium with hydraulic monitors and dynamite and everything. It's placed in there, it's built within less than a year to open up for the big game of 23 and it was a stupid place to build it in the first place and it was even stupider to rebuild it in the same place because as you know the Hayward Fault goes bisects it. Um, and. Um, so, uh, but there it is, you know, uh, nothing much we can do about that. Um, now, uh, just the year before, Hearst Hall, which had been designed by Maybeck um, and then given to the university by Phoebe Hearst as the women's gymnasium, burns down overnight. And let us remember that the terms of the contract with John Galen Howard. Unfortunately for him, um, <coughs> William Randolph Hearst contacts the president immediately says I want that gym to be rebuilt in permanent materials and I want Bernard Maybeck to do it. Oops. Um, John Galen Howard will soon be out of the picture. This is the Hearst gym that we come to know. It is actually a Maybeck Morgan, Julia Morgan collaboration. The first plans by Maybeck were just too impractical so they bring in Julia Morgan and they designed, together they designed this wonderful, very Beaux-Arts building in plan but actually not uh, in layout uh, because it's kind of mysterious. It really doesn't quite work and that's because it's incomplete. There it is, uh, right on axis with the Campanile. Um, it's perfectly symmetrical, but there are things about it that just don't make any sense, and that's because, as I say, it's incomplete. Um, it's a wonderful pool. This is where I swim, and um, but we tend to forget 
uh, that it's not exactly what it was meant to be and there's been design erosion over the years slowly enough that most people aren't aware of what was once there and what was intended. This is Maybeck's uh, design for it. It was all supposed to be colored like the Palace of Fine Arts was originally and totally landscaped. It's a total site design like the Palace of Fine Arts and in fact it was once. When I was an undergraduate, it looked like this. The planter boxes had oak trees in them, there were vines crawling over it. It was to be kind of like a ruin, like the Palace of Fine Arts. And to some extent, it still is that way. There are live oak trees just growing right out of it, as Maybeck and Morgan intended. This is the East Court with the uh, trees growing towards the sky. It's an absolutely wonderful building. I love photographing this thing. It is such a character actor. Here it is in the late afternoon sunlight. And I realized one of the things that inspired it. Maxfield Parrish, um, who was doing his paintings at that time. And um, this is not a stretch because John um, William Randolph Hearst actually commissioned um, hired Maxfield Parrish to do covers for him and collected his paintings. And uh, William Randolph Hearst also play, played an active role in the design of Her the Hearst Gymnasium. And here's an original photograph, which Roberta will be, be showing you more of these. So you can begin to see, um, and here's the colonnade upstairs. Here's one of Parrish's most famous paintings, probably many of you, your parents had these. They were in millions of American homes. And in fact, actually, they made it into a video, um, a music video by Michael Jackson and uh, Lisa Marie Presley, which you can find on, online if you're interested. OK, as I said, it's incomplete. And the, the reason for that is that there was supposed to be a building to the north of it. In fact, the gymnasium was only a podium for that building, which was going to be this. You can see the podium over there. Uh, it was going to be a gigantic auditorium um, seating the entire university. Um, three sides would have been the Arch of Constantine. Um, so this thing was big. Um, and here you can see it, um, the gymnasium, the auditorium. And so over here is the Morgan Maybeck. Uh, campus. And over there is the John Galen Howard campus. Howard's design is much more typical. It's buildings in space. Maybeck's is space in buildings. And it's going to get bigger. <coughs> Meanwhile, what do you do with mom's stuff? Um, here, <laughs> this is a problem that William Randolph Hearst had because his mother was as maniacal a collector as he was. And her house in Pleasanton and various other places were just filled with stuff. He wants to give it to the university, especially her anthropology collections. She was largely the founder of the Department of Anthropology. And she had a large role in paleontology and architecture as well, too, and many of the other departments on campus. So here's the gym. Here's the auditorium. They add this, which is a complex of buildings um, which is going to house the Phoebe Hearst collections. It's the William Randolph Hearst plan or the May Maybeck Morgan plan. And this is what's there today, not quite what they had intended, but over to the left is the Phoebe Hearst Anthropology Museum with largely her collection in it. So what happened to the Phoebe Hearst plan? Well, the Depression happened and this happened. Um, the, this really, even for William Randolph Hearst, this stretched his pocketbook, especially during the Depression. So the rest of the Phoebe Hearst plan remains undone. Now, to the ruin and the title. Um, if you walk around and look at John Galen Howard's buildings closely, they look fine from a distance, but if it, the closer you look, the more disturbing it becomes. Margareta will talk more about this. I'm just going to concentrate, this is Hilgard Hall, I'm going to concentrate on the Hearst Gymnasium, which is what concerns me. Um, this is the ceiling, which is leaking. Um, the, um, the rebar is rusting out of the reinforced concrete. Uh, the windows are smashed in the locker rooms. There is very little maintenance. Very, this is not at all like the new buildings on campus. The architectural uh, sculpture is cracking all over the place, and the, the water is getting to the rebar inside, which then expands, of course. The concrete is falling. The bronze is in bad shape. This is the west courtyard of, of, uh, slide from a slide I took uh, decades ago when it was still landscaped. Uh, they'd already removed the, um, 
the um, sculpture there, and uh, there were Adirondack chairs, etc. But then I got really sick a few years ago of looking at the dry pool, the weeds, the styrofoam cups, the dead leaves, etc. So I actually started a garden there, and this is my garden to Phoebe. Um, and um, well, she deserved better. Um, and. Um, but my real concern is in the east court, it appears that the building is separating, the superstructure is separating from its foundations. And if that is the case, then in fact the building is approaching irreparability. Remember, it covers, by my accounting, about it, it appears about three acres of very valuable real estate, only two stories tall. Okay, now what about progress? Uh, you may remember the slogan, progress is our most important product. That was General Electric, um, and the person who enunciated that was a Hollywood uh, grade B actor named Ronald Reagan um, for General Electric, and um, it was very much a part of my growing up. The idea that the future is what's important, um, not the past. Now, this is Julia Morgan building. It was the senior women's hall, um, renamed Girton Hall, and there was a proposal to move this down to the west entrance of the campus to serve as a visitor's uh, reception center, but the administration decided that it would just be too fusty uh, for a progressive uh, university such as this, uh, give the, the uh, people who were coming onto campus the wrong idea about it, even though it was designed by one of the most illustrious of our alumna, and so it was moved up to um, the Botanical Garden to accommodate a $70 million expansion of the Haas Business School. Um, now, the point I want to get to here is that the administration will tell you we just simply don't have the money to maintain our older buildings. So I want to show you what's gone up in the most recent years. Just a few of the structures that have gone up. And these figures are rough because it's very difficult to get a real accounting of how much these cost or where the money has actually come from. Uh, so, and the, these figures are probably without interest. Um, the various Blumhall, I'm sure this costs a great deal more than that. And one of the things that's interesting about these new buildings is that uh, so many of them are closed to the public that they ostensibly serve. Um, you can't get into them. I'm sure that this building actually cost a great deal more than 113 million. Most of you probably hardly notice it. It's up on the hillside on a very geologically unstable slope. Um, it is absolutely gigantic. It hasn't been finished yet, uh, but you can see it glittering up there at night. And then this is to be built on the Tang uh, parking lot, um, this um, spectacular aquatic center. Um, for the Cal Memorial Stadium and High Performance Center, we actually have done uh, figures to figure out um, what it's going to cost amortized over a century with uh, interest. It's about a one and a quarter billion dollars. Uh, I don't know how we're going to pay that off, especially if the team keeps losing. Um, but probably long before that, it will be wrecked when the uh, Hayward Fault lurches. Um, as geologist Garnus Curtis warned the regions, he said, don't build anything there. It's far too dangerous, uh, not just because of the uh, fault displacement, because of the danger of landslides from um, Cheapskate Hill that could come crashing down on it. The regions completely ignored him and went ahead and did it anyway, which is why I say it was a, not a very bright thing to do. Okay, what I, what I want to wrap up with is that um, with neoliberalism, um, and I've actually brought um, an, a fascinating article. It's actually a, um, um, it's a review of Wiseman's uh, documentary at Berkeley by Andrew O'Hare, who does the film reviews for Salon Magazine. And uh, I brought that, and I hope you'll all pick it up, because it's not just a, a review of the movie. It's actually about the broader uh, concern of neoliberalism and how neoliberalism has actually colonized not only our bodies, but our minds as well, too. So it precludes many uh, possibilities that we once had. We don't even 
even think about them anymore. And one of the things that is precluded and which is vanishing is the very idea of civic responsibility. If you want to call it the public, the, the public trust, the public domain, the public itself, which is one of the things that the Living New Deal studies. Um, and we see that in the now the current liquidation of the U.S. Postal Service and the sale of these historic buildings and public art around the country by the real estate arm of Regent Blum, um, which is happening all over the country now. This is the word that we, we hear constantly invoked on campus. It comes in practically every day through my uh, email account. Um, innovation. Innovation. And uh, as a matter of fact, today's editorial in the Daily Cal is the art of innovation. Um, starts out with a quote by Peter Drucker. Innovation is the specific instrument of entrepreneurship, the act that endows resources with a new capacity to create wealth. We get this all the time. This is what I mean by the colonization of our minds. Um, Gordon Gecko would have loved this statement. Um, but innovation and entrepreneurship and wealth all the time, product. What we tend to forget is that this is the Phoebe Hearst Memorial Gymnasium. And I want to stress memorial. We've seen several memorials already. What is memorial? It is to, to memorialize, to remember those people who had come before us and gave us all of this stuff. I want to go back to the me memento mori that was partly the inspiration for the Palace of Fine Arts and the Hearst Gymnasium. The reason for paintings like this is to remind us of the inevitability of our end. And so um, here's a mnemonic device. You can remember innovation. Um, innovation without memory rhymes with annihilation. And the reason for that is we have to um, that memory is what tempers our hubris so that we don't go too far. But unfortunately that connection is largely being lost today. You may know that the Canadian, that the Harper government in Canada has actually trashed eight of its scientific libraries which were hold inconvenient information about climate change and oceanography. But what you may not know is that UC got a head start on Canada. Uh, four years ago, um, high administrators got rid of the uh, Water Resource Center archive and its um, very, very popular symposia, um, symposia, standing room only. Um, and it very quietly got rid of it, sending it to UC's most inaccessible campus, Riverside where for the last four years it has become a dead archive. This is the memory which gives us the baseline without which we cannot really deal with issues such as the twin tunnels under the delta and the drought today because it takes away our baseline. And perhaps that's not accidental. But this, I think, was a shameful act. It was done by um, Vice President Dan Dooley who, as far as I can see, has no academic qualifications whatsoever. Um, and I don't know whether he also was responsible for UC San Diego closing uh, four or five of its research library, including the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, one of the finest in the world. They closed that one, too, at the same time. The difference between UC and Canada is that the scientists in Canada have fought back. They knew what this meant to lose their memory. So ultimately, let's remember that this is not just the Hearst Gymnasium, it's the Phoebe Hearst Memorial Gymnasium. And the whole purpose of this is to remember, to remember the shoulders of those upon whom we stand who have given us so much. President uh, Campbell said after her death that Phoebe Apperson Hearst was the best friend that the university ever had. I think there's no disputing that, um, and um, oops, uh, there's no disputing that, and I think that she deserves better, as do the buildings which she left us and endowed us with. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.